Chapter 16 of A Journey into the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne, translated by Frederick Mallison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Boldly Down the Crater Supper was rapidly devoured, and the little company housed themselves as best they could. The bed was hard, the shelter not very substantial, and our position an anxious one, at five thousand feet above the sea level. Yet I slept particularly well. It was one of the best nights I had ever had, and I did not even dream. Next morning we awoke half frozen by the sharp keen air, but with the light of a splendid sun. I rose from my granite bed and went out to enjoy the magnificent spectacle that lay unrolled before me. I stood on the very summit of the southernmost of Snaffell's peaks. The range of the eye extended over the whole island. By an optical law which obtains at all great heights, the shore seemed raised and the center depressed. It seemed as if one of Helbesmer's raised maps lay at my feet. I could see deep valleys intersecting each other in every direction, precipices like low walls, lakes reduced to ponds, rivers abbreviated into streams. On my right were numberless glaciers and innumerable peaks, some plumed with feathery clouds of smoke. The undulating surface of these endless mountains, crested with sheets of snow, reminded one of a stormy sea. If I looked westward, there the ocean lay spread out in all its magnificence, like a mere continuation of those flock-like summits. The eye could hardly tell where the snowy ridges ended and the foaming waves began. I was thus steeped in the marvelous ecstasy which all high summits develop in the mind. And now, without giddiness, for I was beginning to be accustomed to the sublime aspects of nature. My dazzled eyes were bathed in the bright flood of the solar rays. I was forgetting where and who I was, to live the life of elves and sylphs, the fanciful creation of Scandinavian superstitions. I felt intoxicated with the sublime pleasure of lofty elevations, without thinking of the profound abysses into which I was shortly to be plunged. But I was brought back to the realities of things by the arrival of Hans and the professor, who joined me on the summit. My uncle pointed out to me in the far west a light steam or mist, a semblance of land, which bounded the distant horizon of waters. "'Greenland,' said he. "'Greenland?' I cried. "'Yes. We are only thirty-five leagues from it, and during thaws the white bears, borne by the ice-fields from the north, are carried even into Iceland. But never mind that. Here we are at the top of Snaffell, and here are two peaks, one north and one south. Hans will tell us the name of that on which we are now standing.' The question being put, Hans replied, Skartaris. My uncle shot a triumphant glance at me. Now for the crater, he cried. The crater of Snaffell resembled an inverted cone, the opening of which might be half a league in diameter. Its depth appeared to be about two thousand feet. Imagine the aspect of such a reservoir, brimful and running over with liquid fire amid the rolling thunder. The bottom of the funnel was about two hundred fifty feet in circuit, so that the gentle slope allowed its lower brim to be reached without much difficulty. Involuntarily I compared the whole crater to an enormous erected mortar, and the comparison put me in a terrible fright. What madness, I thought, to go down into a mortar, perhaps a loaded mortar, to be shot up into the air at a moment's notice. But I did not try to back out of it. Hans, with perfect coolness, resumed the lead, and I followed him without a word. In order to facilitate the descent, Hans wound his way down the cone by a spiral path. Our route lay amidst eruptive rocks, some of which, shaken out of their loosened beds, rushed bounding down the abyss, and in their fall awoke echoes remarkable for their loud and well-defined sharpness. In certain parts of the cone there were glaciers. Here Hans advanced only with extreme precaution, sounding his way with his iron-pointed pole to discover any crevasses in it. At particularly dubious passages we were obliged to connect ourselves with each other by a long cord, in order that any man who missed his footing might be held up by his companions. This solid formation was prudent, 
but did not remove all danger. Yet, notwithstanding the difficulties of the descent, down steeps unknown to the guide, the journey was accomplished without accidents, except the loss of a coil of rope, which escaped from the hands of an Icelander and took the shortest way to the bottom of the abyss. At midday we arrived. I raised my head and saw straight above me the upper aperture of the cone, framing a bit of sky of very small circumference, but almost perfectly round. Just upon the edge appeared the snowy peak of Sarus, standing out sharp and clear against the endless space. At the bottom of the crater were three chimneys, through which, in its eruptions, Snafel had driven forth fire and lava from its central furnace. Each of these chimneys was a hundred feet in diameter. They gaped before us right in our path. I had not the courage to look down either of them, but Professor Liedenbrock had hastily surveyed all three. He was panting, running from one to the other, gesticulating and uttering incoherent expressions. Hans and his comrades, seated upon loose lava rocks, looked at him with as much wonder as they knew how to express, and perhaps taking him for an escaped lunatic. Suddenly my uncle uttered a cry. I thought his foot must have slipped and that he had fallen down one of the holes. But no, I saw him with arms outstretched and legs straddling wide apart, erect before a granite rock that stood in the center of the crater, just like a pedestal made ready to receive a statue of Pluto. He stood like a man stupefied, but the stupefaction soon gave way to a delirious rapture. "'Axel! Axel!' he cried. "'Come! Come!' I ran. Hans and the Icelanders never stirred. "'Look!' cried the professor. And. Sharing his astonishment, but I think not his joy, I read on the western face of the block, in runic characters, half moldered away with lapse of ages, this thrice accursed name. Arnsactism, replied my uncle. Do you yet doubt? I made no answer, and I returned in silence to my lava seat in a state of utter speechless consternation. Here was crushing evidence. How long I remained plunged in agonizing reflections I cannot tell. All that I know is that on raising my head again I saw only my uncle and Hans at the bottom of the crater. The Icelanders had been dismissed, and they were now descending the outer slopes of Snafel to return to Stapi. Hans slept peaceably at the foot of a rock in a lava bed, where he had found a suitable couch for himself. But my uncle was pacing around the bottom of the crater like a wild beast in a cage. I had neither the wish nor the strength to rise, and following the guide's example I went off into an unhappy slumber, fancying I could hear ominous noises or feel tremblings within the recesses of the mountain. Thus the first night in the crater passed away. The next morning a gray, heavy, cloudy sky seemed to droop over the summit of the cone. I did not know this first from the appearances of nature, but I found it out by my uncle's impetuous wrath. I soon found out the cause, and hope dawned again in my heart. For this reason. Of the three ways open before us, one had been taken by Sacknesum. The indications of the learned Icelander hinted at in the cryptogram pointed to this fact that the shadow of Scartaris came to touch that particular way during the latter days of the month of June. That sharp peak might hence be considered as the gnomon of a vast sundial, the shadow projected from which on a certain day would point out the road to the center of the earth. Now no sun, no shadow, and therefore no guide. Here was June twenty-fifth. If the sun was clouded for six days we must postpone our visit till next year. My limited powers of description would fail were I to attempt a picture of the professor's angry impatience. The day wore on, and no shadow came to lay itself along the bottom of the crater. Hans did not move from the spot he had selected, yet he must be asking himself what we were waiting for, if he asked himself anything at all. My uncle spoke not a word to me. His gaze, ever directed upwards, was lost in the gray and misty space beyond. On the twenty-sixth nothing yet. Rain mingled with snow was falling all day long. Hans built a hut of pieces of lava. 
I felt a malicious pleasure in watching the thousand rills and cascades that came tumbling down the sides of the cone, and the deafening continuous din awakened by every stone against which they bounded. My uncle's rage knew no bounds. It was enough to irritate a meeker man than he, for it was foundering almost within the port. But heaven never sends unmixed grief, and for Professor Liedenbrock there was a satisfaction in store proportioned to his desperate anxieties. The next day the sky was again overcast, but on the twenty-ninth of June, the last day but one of the month, with the change of the moon came a change of weather. The sun poured a flood of light down the crater. Every hillock, every rock and stone, every projecting surface had its share of the beaming torrent, and threw its shadow on the ground. Amongst them all, Scartaris laid down his sharp-pointed angular shadow which began to move slowly in the opposite direction to that of the radiant orb. My uncle turned too and followed it. At noon, being at its least extent, it came and softly fell upon the edge of the middle chimney. "'There it is! There it is!' shouted the professor. "'Now for the center of the globe!' he added in Danish. I looked at Hans to hear what he would say. Forut, was his tranquil answer. Forward, replied my uncle. It was thirteen minutes past one. End of chapter 16